More than 1,500 years before the reign of Elizabeth I of England, Cleopatra proved that women were capable of ruling nations, and that they could do it with intelligence, grace, and sometimes brutality. But much of what we know about the Queen of the Nile comes from history that has been fictionalized, re-fictionalized, and then fictionalized some more, so much that the made-up stuff is sometimes better known than the facts, and the facts themselves are kinda surprising. Weak am I. She knows how to beat her slaves well enough, but she cannot throw away that pipe. And she knows it. Not from around here. If someone asked you to name an Egyptian from ancient history, it would probably be a toss-up between King Tut and Cleopatra. For many people, these are the two historical figures that embody ancient Egypt. Gilded, eyelinered, and walking around their luxurious palaces with their hands at 90-degree angles like in that Bengal song from the 80s. But here's a funny thing. One of those two people was not actually Egyptian. You gotta be f***ing kidding. We're not. According to the history of Macedonia, Cleopatra was a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which was descended from Alexander the Great's general, a man named Ptolemy of Lagos. That means they not only had Greek ancestry, they spoke Greek and followed Greek customs too. The Ptolemies ruled Egypt for 300 years after the nation was handed over to Ptolemy following Alexander's passing in 323 BC. So how did Egypt wind up in the hands of a bunch of helmet-wearing dudes from another continent? They conquered it, which is what the ancient Greeks often did whenever they got bored. Keeping it in the family Inbreeding, as it turns out, is not just for nasty Lannister queens and deliverance characters, it was practiced to some degree in pretty much every royal family from Europe to the Middle East, but the Egyptians practically turned it into a competitive sport. In Egyptian mythology, the god Osiris married his sister Isis in order to maintain the purity of the royal bloodline. They were gods, so presumably genetic disorders weren't really a problem for them. Unfortunately for the Egyptian pharaohs, who saw the Egyptian gods as awesome role models, genetic disorders were a problem for mortals. Anyway, when the Ptolemies rose to power, they were all, hey, this inbreeding thing sounds like a great idea. So by the time that got down to Cleopatra a few hundred years later, she was a genetic soup of mish-mashed Ptolemies. In keeping with their very gross, noble family tradition, Cleopatra went on to marry both of her younger brothers. You. A beautiful mind. Pretty much every modern and semi-modern depiction of Cleopatra tells us she was stunningly beautiful, which frankly does seem sort of incompatible with the whole generations of incest thing, but maybe it was a fluke. In February 2007, a coin was unearthed bearing a portrait of Cleopatra, which appears to confirm that the queen was actually rather ordinary looking. The fact that ancient historians didn't say much about her looks also suggests she was no Elizabeth Taylor, but the more important point is that it really doesn't matter. Life of Antony, written by Plutarch in 75 AD, made the following observation about Cleopatra. Her actual beauty was not so remarkable that none could be compared with her, or that no one could see her without being struck by it, but the contact of her presence was irresistible. The character that attended all she said or did was something bewitching. Turns out, Cleopatra wasn't just a shrewd and charming diplomat, she was also a student of mathematics, medicine, alchemy, economics, history, geography, and pretty much every general education subject you probably detested in college. Oh, and she spoke nine languages, so feel free to bring that up to your snobby hipster friend next time they try to order from your favorite sushi spot in Japanese. Twisted Sister in Egypt, it was customary for pharaohs to rule in pairs. Every regent needed a co-regent of the opposite gender. According to live science, Cleopatra ruled with her father Ptolemy XII for a short time until his demise in 51 BC. In his will, Ptolemy XII decreed that Cleopatra should marry her 11-year-old brother, which was probably only a ceremonial thing. Either way, the two were clearly not fond of each other, and the relationship ended with Ptolemy XIII trying to wrest control of the throne and his sister appealing to Julius Caesar for help reining him in. If you ally with my sister, I will kill every last Roman in Alexandria. Enough of the big words, little brother. Caesar and Cleopatra famously became lovers, and Ptolemy XIII was never happy with Caesar's decision that he should rule with his sister. Eventually, Caesar defeated Ptolemy at the Battle of the Nile, and Ptolemy drowned in the river while trying to escape, so Cleopatra was really only partially responsible for sending her brother to a watery grave. But wait! There's more! Because of the whole must-have-a-co-regent thing, Cleopatra had to marry her other brother, who later died under mysterious circumstances. In other words, Cleopatra had him poisoned. Then she ordered the execution of her sister Arsinoe, 
who took Ptolemy's side during the family feud and at one point declared herself queen. In conclusion, Game of Thrones is plagiarized from Cleopatra's diary. A Scent to Greatness We've already established that Cleopatra was interested in alchemy, but she also understood a bit of actual chemistry. She believed in the power of fragrance not just as a cosmetic, but also as a tool of persuasion. According to Perfume Power, Cleopatra doused her ship's sails with perfume before sailing to her first rendezvous with Mark Antony to make sure that he smelled her before he saw her. She also owned a perfume factory, which sort of seems like an odd side job for a queen, but if you just can't find the sort of mind-control fragrances you need at the Macy's perfume counter, there's probably some value in just having it done at your own factory. The ruins of Cleopatra's perfume factory are located near the Dead Sea, and there's evidence that it also operated as a sort of day spa. Some seating remains, which is reminiscent of the chairs you might sit in to have your nails done or if you, too, wanted to be doused with mind control fragrances. Born This Way Many ancient rulers saw themselves as divine, even godlike. For Cleopatra, the whole ruler as divine thing was part ego, part public relations genius. It's your universe, and you are God. I am God." According to scholar Elizabeth A. McCabe, Cleopatra called herself the New Isis, telling her subjects she was the embodiment of Isis on Earth, or the reincarnation of the goddess. Not to be left out, Mark Antony also claimed to be the embodiment of Osiris on Earth. Remember the whole Isis marries her brother Osiris thing? There you go. Now, that's not to say that Cleopatra was very dedicated to the whole Isis thing. Prior to that, she was known to play whichever goddess happened to suit her. When she sailed to that first meeting with Mark Antony on her perfumed barge, she was dressed as the goddess Venus and was waited on by young boys dressed as cupids and maids dressed as sea nymphs. Antony was enamored, to say the least, because who doesn't get all hot and bothered when their crush shows up for a first date on a perfumed barge dressed as a deity? Reality Bites one of Cleopatra's most enduring legends has not to do with her life, but her untimely passing. According to the story, when Cleopatra learned her forces had been defeated by Octavian Augustus, who would become the first emperor of Rome, she killed herself by holding a venomous snake to her breast. Because historians like to debate things, no one really definitively accepts this account of Cleopatra's death. For a start, the story indicates that it took only a few minutes for her to die. But the venom of that particular kind of Egyptian snake actually takes a few hours to work and is even occasionally survivable. According to the Smithsonian, most historians do agree Cleopatra's death was self-inflicted, but the method isn't clear. It's possible she simply drank a bunch of poison, but that story just isn't as dramatic, which is probably why today most people still think it was a snake. Got Milk? Like pretty much every human being, Cleopatra had an innate desire to avoid getting older. Lines, wrinkles, and those little sunken places? Not anymore. Unfortunately, plastic surgeons were in short supply in 1st century BC Egypt, and Botox wouldn't be invented for another couple millennia, so Cleopatra had to get creative. According to legend, Cleopatra's daily bath required a tub and 700 lactating donkeys. You heard that right? According to the Vintage News, all over the ancient world, women used donkey milk to keep their skin pale and to keep wrinkles at bay. Emperor Nero's wife was said to travel with whole troops of she-asses so she'd never have to miss her daily donkey milk bath. And today, scientists know donkey milk has a lot of important health benefits. It can be used as a cow milk substitute for people with allergies, and yes, it's also used in modern beauty products, just in case you don't think you'll be able to procure yourself 700 donkeys and enough servants to milk them every day. A Woman Scorned Throughout much of ancient history, women with cheating husbands were just expected to smile happily and pretend like they weren't feeling totally humiliated. So imagine what Julius Caesar's wife Calpurnia must have thought when her husband erected a gilded statue of Cleopatra in the temple of Venus Genetrix, right next to the statue of the goddess herself. This was obnoxious on a number of levels, not just because Caesar seemed completely indifferent to how a very public statue of his mistress would make his wife feel, but also because the Romans didn't believe their rulers were particularly divine the way the Egyptians did. However scandalized the Roman people were by the statue, it remained in the temple for at least 200 years, so it's possible the statue had at least some religious significance probably because of Cleopatra's association with the goddess Isis, who had her own minor cult following in Rome. 
Invasion of the Husband Snatchers. Mark Antony might not have his priorities in check. Why? Well, he skipped an entire invasion so he could spend the winter with Cleopatra in her Alexandrian palace. That's why. According to History Net, in 41 BC, Antony assembled an army and went east, summoning client kings in hopes of gathering resources for a Parthian invasion. One of those client kings was 28-year-old Cleopatra, who said something to the effect of, let's make love, not war. And then Antony said something to the effect of, the invasion can wait, and followed her back to Alexandria leaving his army in the hands of his governor. To make a long story short, the Parthians soon crossed the Euphrates River, and everything, pardon our French, went to hell. Meanwhile, Antony's wife Fulvia had to flee Rome after getting her butt kicked by Julius Caesar's heir Octavian. It's hard to say which is worse, being attacked by your husband's political rival while he's off cheating on you with his Egyptian queen mistress, or keeping your mouth shut while your husband erects a gilded statue of his Egyptian queen mistress. If Fulvia and Calpurnia had formed a scorned wives club, Roman history would have been a great CW series. Few civilizations have had a more mysterious reputation than ancient Egypt. But the point of a mystery is to solve it, and over the years, researchers have learned a lot about the land of hieroglyphs, holy cats, and very strange walks. But there's still a lot left to learn. Here are some mysteries about ancient Egypt that have yet to be solved. How did King Tut die? King Tutankhamun is perhaps the most famous of all the Egyptian pharaohs, particularly since he was so young when he reigned and died. And while his tomb has been thoroughly excavated, historians still don't quite know how he died. It's kind of humbling, isn't it? Sadly, any obituary that might have contained the answer has long since been lost to the ages. So all we've got is a few decent guesses. In 2013, a group of UK researchers revealed that he had significant damage to his ribs, along with a broken leg, which led the team to conclude that Tut likely died from a chariot crashing into the poor boy king. If cartoons are to be believed, those guys drove like maniacs. But National Geographic pointed out other possibilities as well. It could have been a kick from a horse that did him in, or possibly even a hippo attack. Yet another theory was thrown into the mix by the head of Italy's Institute for Mummies and the Iceman, which is the coolest job title ever. They relied on 2,000 computer scans plus DNA testing of Tut's family to conclude that a chariot accident was near impossible. Tut apparently had a club foot and couldn't stand on his own. The fact that the inside of his tomb contained over 100 walking canes certainly supported that assessment. Thank you much for the walking stick. So, there's no way he was riding on a chariot. The Institute's Professor Zink thinks Tut instead died because he was the product of incest, since his parents were brother and sister. And so, his already weak body simply gave out on him. To further complicate matters, Tut suffered from malaria. That alone could have killed him. But even Zink admits they have no way of knowing for sure. For now, the only thing ironclad about King Tut's death is that it happened, and that he could host a pretty swinging party. Where is Alexander the Great's tomb? Few people came closer to ruling the entire known world than Alexander the Great. Yet, for such a famous guy, we have no idea where he's actually buried. According to Archaeology magazine, there was never supposed to be a tomb at all because Alexander wanted to be thrown into the Euphrates River upon his death in 323 BC. The reason was that he wanted followers to think he rose to heaven to be with his father not his birth father, but an actual god. His generals, however, chose to bury him instead, and he supposedly wound up entombed in three different places. What? First, he was buried in Memphis, Egypt. Then, during either the 4th or 3rd century BC, he was moved to a new tomb in Alexandria. And then, because why not? The good people of Alexandria moved the body to a new location in Alexandria, and that's the last documented time we know of the tomb, when Emperor Caracalla visited it around 215 AD, almost 500 years after Alexander's death. At some point, the tomb was likely damaged and vandalized, and now we don't have any part of it to look at, including Alexander's body. Identifying the Sphinx For centuries, we knew next to nothing about the Sphinx. Until 1817, all we could see was its head peeking out from layers and layers of sand. But since then, we've learned that Pharaoh Kafka probably built it using hundreds of paid laborers and a humongous chunk of nearby limestone. Other than that, we still know very little about the Sphinx, including what it symbolizes. Obviously, it was built for some reason, we just don't know what it is. 
Some theorists believe it's meant to be a god from that era named Rudy, who was comprised of two lions joined at the back and guarded the entrance to the underworld. But that's just an educated guess. For now, all we can do is enjoy the strange side of the Sphinx that stands alongside the Great Pyramid of Giza. And how'd that nose break off? Well, at least we can blame the Flash for that one. What happened to Queen Nefertiti? Aside from Cleopatra, there might not be a more famous Egyptian queen than Nefertiti. For years, she ruled alongside Pharaoh Akhenaten, until she just vanished. After 1336 BC, there are no records of what happened to her. We don't even have her tomb or mummy, despite many supposed discoveries, so all we're left with are theories. One such theory is that she became a co-regent with Akhenaten and changed her name to Neferneferaten. Another idea is that she changed her name to Smenkakar and became a full-blown pharaoh while disguised as a man. We may learn the answers to this mystery sooner than later. In 2015, Egypt's Minister of Antiquities announced that an additional chamber, or possibly two, may have been found in King Tut's tomb, and one of them may wind up being Nefertiti's crypt. If so, researchers could perhaps finally deduce when she died. And if any artwork in the crypt indicates whether she took power in her own right, was brutally murdered somehow, or simply vanished to a life of post-royalty anonymity. If it worked for Bridget Fonda, it definitely works for an Egyptian queen. Tomb of the Unknown Princess In 1908, historians stumbled across a royal burial site no one had ever seen before. And over a century later, we still don't know who was buried there. The grave was discovered in Kerna, Thebes, and contained the bodies of two people, with coffins dated to around the 17th or 18th dynasties. That means the bodies were at least 250 years older than King Tud and Nefertiti. One mummy was a young woman, the other was a child, presumably hers. They both wore priceless jewelry made of gold and ivory, so clearly they were important. Unfortunately, the inscription that might reveal who they are has been damaged beyond legibility, leaving only King's great wife to be discerned. There are a few possibilities based on the queens of the time. To name a few, she might have been Numenhat, or the as yet unidentified wife of Rahaptep. We have far fewer, if any, clues about the kid's identity. For the time being, it's looking to stay that way. The pair are scheduled to be unveiled at the Museum of Scotland in 2018, once a new Egyptian gallery is all set to go. Maybe then someone will figure out who they are and the museum's guests will finally learn the truth behind these mysterious figures. Or they can just gawk at all the pretty jewelry. Compared to other ancient civilizations, life was simpler back in Greece, right? Wrong. While we'd like to imagine it as a cultured and sophisticated society, there's absolutely no way you'd survive life in ancient Greece for long. Here's why. Feeling unwell? Prior to the 5th century BCE, the human body was basically left to the mercy of the gods. Patients often participated in a healing ritual called temple sleep, or incubation. It's exactly what it sounds like. Patients would literally just go to sleep in a temple, and then in the morning, they'd tell a priest about their dreams from the night before. Based on that dream, the priest would then prescribe a remedy, usually in the form of an incantation or a charm of some sort, or they'd simply declare the patient healed. There were technically doctors back then, but there weren't any specific requirements for people who advertised themselves as such. And as for surgery, these were the kinds of tools that were used, the stuff of nightmares. This is going to be extremely painful, Mr. Verrill. Meanwhile, anyone who happened to live in Athens in 430 BC had a roughly 25% chance of dying in a horrible way. That's because a mysterious plague broke out that lasted for about five years, and the death toll was catastrophic. The plague ended up killing somewhere between 75,000 to 100,000 people. Many aspects of the human body were a complete mystery in ancient Greece. People firmly believed that if a woman was ill, it was likely because she'd fallen victim to a wayward womb. You heard that right. This ancient piece of pseudoscience even had a name, the wandering womb. Some physicians believe the womb was an entirely separate entity that just so happened to live inside women. According to Wired, it was widely believed that these freewheeling wombs would be coaxed back into place by applying pleasant smells to a woman's you-know-what. Meanwhile, highly unpleasant smells were applied to whatever part of the body the womb had theoretically wandered off to. Oh, and there was another treatment prescribed for keeping a womb in place. 
pregnancy. And in the ancient world, pregnancy and delivery were exceptionally dangerous. According to women in antiquity, a pregnancy was prescribed for everything from fever and insomnia to chronic back pain. Jeez. Sparta is widely considered to be the most militaristic of the Greek city-states. At the height of its power, around 404 BC, the city of Sparta didn't even have walls. Inhabitants evidently felt that they didn't need them, because they had Spartans. When it comes to Sparta, figuring out what's real and what's fiction can be tough. We know the land in Sparta was very fertile, and not having to worry about food meant that people could focus on other hobbies, like poetry and bloody battle. This is Sparta! Sparta's militaristic bent began when it managed to conquer the neighboring land of Messenia, turning its inhabitants into slaves. Boys were trained from the age of 7 to 20, and they were basically expected to be resistant to hunger and cold, despite having given precious little in the way of food, clothing, or supplies. If they were suspected of having any kind of disability, the Spartans would kill them, usually when they were infants. According to National Geographic, the only time these slaves got a break from training was when they were actually at war. According to the BBC, the ancient Greeks took a minimalist approach to makeup. They didn't want the cosmetics to appear obvious. They just wanted their skin to look healthy. Unfortunately, these cosmetics were made from lead and mercury. In fact, such powders were used well into the 19th century. According to University College London, that's when women started using much more of the stuff and the damaging effects became quite apparent. Blackened skin baldness, even damaged teeth. According to NBC News, both men and women in ancient Greece took to wearing lead face cream, which was believed to help keep their complexions clear, and even improve the condition of their skin. It did neither, of course. Around 1177 BC, several civilizations fell, including the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and the early Greek civilizations like the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. Cities were sacked and burned, trade routes abandoned, in a letter, Babylonian king Hammurabi described the scenario like this, Behold, the enemy's ships came, my cities were burned, and they did evil things in my country. No one's really sure who these enemies were, but they do know a great many people met a grisly end at the hands of a group of raiders known only as the Sea Peoples. Egyptian records tell tall tales of a mysterious people who laid waste to the entire area. It seems as though they first showed up alongside the Hittites. Strangely, no one recorded who they were or exactly where they came from. They fought in Egypt and the Mediterranean for centuries, destroying entire cities and settlements and then moving on. And then these mysterious pirates fell out of Egyptian history in 1178 BC. Would you have survived their warships and ceaseless rampages? We're guessing the answer is no. According to punishment in ancient Athens, people were often punished by society out of sheer anger. Anyone could bring charges against anyone else. About 96% of surviving court documents feature cases in which one person simply hated the other. By the time both parties were in court, it was the prosecutor's job to make the jury feel equally angry so that punishment could be handed out and supposed justice served. Suffice it to say, the laws of ancient Greece could be incredibly brutal. In the 7th century BC, Athens asked an aristocrat named Draco to draft a new set of laws. This fellow is why we use the word draconian to describe particularly brutal laws. He was, in short, a complete and utter jerk. As Encyclopedia Britannica explains it, draconian laws were said to be written in blood rather than ink. Death was prescribed for almost all criminal offenses. Think you would have survived these harsh laws? You likely would have been sentenced to death for such arrogance. The definition of clean is extremely relative. Hygiene standards vary throughout the world, and they've changed drastically throughout history. Baths were only a weekly occurrence for most people even just a century ago. What people further back in history did to stay clean is even stranger. Here are weird things the ancients thought about cleaning. The ancient Romans left behind a ton of writing, and they weren't shy about their habits. The poet Catullus once wrote about how nice it was to brush your teeth with urine, for example. According to the Smithsonian, the ammonia in urine acted as a bleaching agent, leading to those oh-so-desirable pearly whites. It's possible they refined the urine into ammonia before putting it into their mouths. Hopefully. Archaeologists are still learning about what went on in Rome's public baths. According to researchers from the University of Iowa, artifacts recovered from pool drains include plenty of perfume vials, oil flasks, and nail cleaners, among other things, including teeth. 
There were enough teeth that they think Romans were going to baths for socializing, pampering, and some dentistry at the same time. The Romans had to find ways to keep those clothes clean too. And just like for their teeth, the ammonia in urine was how they kept their whites white and their colors bright. It's pee -pee. William Smith described the process in a Dictionary of Greek and Roman Antiquities, and it makes doing laundry today look easy. Most Romans wore wool, and given how hot it is in Italy, their clothes needed a lot of washing. An ancient Roman laundromat was called a felonica, and it was staffed by felonies. It was their job to stomp on clothes in vats of liquid to wash them. That liquid was most commonly a mix of animal and human urine. Collecting all that urine was a part of the felonies' job too. Most often, they would stand on street corners with buckets, hoping passers-by would take the opportunity to relieve themselves. Tough job. After washing, white clothes would be further whitened by being hung in a basket over sulfur fumes, further proving that history smelled absolutely terrible. People have always tried to take care of their teeth to avoid dentists, or in the earliest cases, having to ask their neighbor to knock a molar out with a rock. Mankind had pretty decent teeth until farming and carbs were common. But people living in Sudan around 2,000 years ago had shockingly great teeth. Only about 1% of them had cavities or signs of tooth decay. And it wasn't until 2014 that researchers figured out why. No, it wasn't urine. According to National Geographic, their fine chompers were a consequence of chewing on one of the most noxious invasive weeds in the world, nutsedge. Dr. Mark Schonbeck of the Virginia Association for Biological Farming says it's native to tropical Eurasia but has since spread around the world. Not a good thing for native plants. It's an invasive pest, but modern humans could take a page out of the book of the ancients. Modern research has found that the extracts released when purple nutsedge is chewed destroy the same bacteria that causes cavities and tooth decay. There's one catch. It tastes terrible. Researchers are pretty sure people weren't chewing it for the flavor, but knew it had medicinal benefits, though they maybe weren't aware of its dental perks. Around 3,000 years ago, people living in China were developing methods of using plant ash to remove the toughest grease stains. According to the Epoch Times, for a long time, the water left over from cooking rice would be used for bathing. But around 420 CE, bathing beans were more commonly used. They were made from all sorts of things. And according to the writings of a Su and Tang dynasty doctor named Sun Sum Yao, pig pancreas was a common ingredient. After draining the blood from the pancreas, it was mixed with plaster, bean powder, and fragrances. The resulting bean was used for both skin and clothing, and would have been mostly recognizable to us as soap, even down to the foaming action. Sum Sum Yao recommended different ingredients for people of different statuses. The higher your status, the more ingredients your bath bean would have had. His supplement to the formulas of a thousand gold worth listed a ton of different combinations, and some had dozens of ingredients. With that many combinations, it's not entirely surprising that some of them were caustic, proof that just because it makes suds doesn't mean you should wash your face with it. The smell of sulfur dioxide is unmistakable, hot, rotten eggs, and it's harmful. The Australian government says the chemical causes respiratory damage. I can't breathe. But it wasn't always considered a health hazard. In ancient Greece and many cultures that followed, it was used to purify homes. The first mention of it comes from Homer's Odyssey. When Odysseus kills some rivals, he asks their home to be purified by burning sulfur inside so the house is fit for less horrible people. Burning sulfur was a widespread practice, and this stinky gas was used for lots of different purposes. In India, it was burned in rooms where operations and surgeries were to be performed to purify the air. It was still used during the Middle Ages, too. Sulfur was burned in homes and buildings where residents had died from the plague or other diseases. The logic was strange. Scholars think it started when people observed sulfur fumes killing plants and small animals, so they figured it must kill other tiny things too. To be fair, they weren't entirely wrong. It was just harming them too. A little elbow grease goes a long way, right? Sure, but in antiquity, they were talking about literal Greece. According to the J. Paul Getty Museum, ancient Greco-Roman athletes cleaned up in a counterintuitive way. Before they headed off for a more traditional bath, they scrubbed up with an oil and an abrasive. Sand and ground pumice were common, and once they were covered with that oily mess, they'd scrape it off with a curved tool called a strigil. Both men and women did this, and it was one of the most important tools in any athlete's arsenal. They'd usually oil themselves up before heading to the gym, and once they were done, they'd clean off the worst of the oil, sweat, dirt, and blood with the strigil. It actually gets worse. According to health and fitness history, 
everyone used a strigil, but the muck athletes scraped off themselves was thought to be extra special, with a sort of medicinal power. It was often saved and used as an ingredient in salves and poultices, so regular folks could gain a little athletic talent by osmosis, presumably. It's easy to forget how modern an invention toilet paper is. And this? It's toilet paper. The idea has been around since at least 14th century China, according to ABC, but it took centuries to catch on. Two-ply only showed up in the 1940s, and it was advertised as something everyone should probably use by the 1960s. So what happened before that? Colonial Americans used corn cobs. Old newspapers and catalogs were popular options in the early 1900s. Ancient Rome has perhaps the most questionable method, and it's worth keeping in mind that they had very public toilets. Archaeologist Stephen E. Nash writes in Sapiens that researchers know a lot about Roman toilet habits thanks to the facilities and frescoes preserved in volcanic ash in Pompeii, including illustrations of the Tesorium, a Roman-era sea sponge on a stick, which people would use to wipe themselves after doing their business. And no, people didn't carry their own personal sponges with them. They were just as public as the toilets. If running water wasn't handy, buckets of salt water and vinegar would be left by the toilets so people could rinse off the sponges before leaving them for the next person. Let's be glad most movies and TV shows about ancient Rome left that part out. This might have been interesting to include, though. In the 1960s, archaeologists were excavating ancient Roman sites in England, and when they got to the toilets, they uncovered small stone discs called pesoi. They were originally thought to be game pieces, but further research and the common Greek saying, three stones are enough to wipe, suggest they were actually a sort of reusable toilet paper. And that's not all. According to Scientific American, some of the pesoi started out as ostraca, broken pieces of ceramic that people would etch with the names of other people they just didn't like. They were usually used in voting to banish someone from town. Later, it looks like they were recycled and used to clean up after using the toilet. How satisfying must it have been to use stones etched with the names of your enemies to clean up after a visit to the throne? A lot of hygiene jokes have been mean-spiritedly directed toward the French, and according to a study published in Chicago journals, there's a historic cultural reason for that particular long-standing stereotype. After large areas of France were destroyed during World War II, French leaders even called for a much-needed hygiene revolution as the country's cities were rebuilt and restored. Before that, laundry days happened maybe twice a year, and it was believed that a good day of hard labor was all the cleaning the body needed. The stronger a person's body odor, the healthier they were thought to be. The French lower classes held dirt and sweat in the highest regard. You've given our house permanent B.O. Put it outside! The upper classes had a different philosophy about hygiene. Modesty was of utmost importance, and the idea that someone would touch the most private places of their own body to wash them was met with revulsion and shocked horror. Those that did bathe did so with their clothes, or at least underclothes, on. Most people didn't even bother with bathing, only washing their hands and faces. Nuns were forbidden from washing anything above their ankles, and the French aversion to touching oneself to wash was a huge hindrance in the catching up to the rest of the world's idea of cleanliness. In 1865, it got so bad that a new law made teachers responsible for teaching students why it was important to change their underwear at least every few days. Yes, they had to pass a law. None of this is true today, of course, but it's been a tough association to shape. Bizarre beliefs about cleanliness aren't just found in the ancient world. Just a few decades ago, American women were encouraged to engage in an insanely dangerous practice. In the first half of the 20th century, Lysol, the disinfectant still used today, was marketed as both a douche and a form of birth control. And before 1953, it was even more dangerous. The original formulation of the cleaner contained Cresol, which Mother Jones says was linked to health consequences, including burns and even death. Yet women were still being encouraged to use it to clean themselves in their most private areas. At the same time, it was also being marketed as a treatment for ringworm and a germicide that could keep toilets sparkling. It's unclear just what advertisers thought was going on down there, but they continued to push Lysol as a feminine hygiene product for decades after it was found to be not only ineffective, but dangerous. Through the 1940s, it was actually the country's most popular birth control method, even though it had been linked to deaths as early as 1911. Lawsuits had been filed in the 1930s after women started claiming Lysol was giving them burns, but the manufacturers were cleared and sales continued. It wasn't until the 1960s that Lysol stopped marketing itself as a feminine hygiene product, and it fell out of favor as birth control after the birth control pill came onto the market. The trouble with history is that it's only as good as the people who write it down. 
Thus, we know relatively little about ancient history because written languages didn't exist for a while. With that in mind, here are some ancient discoveries we still can't explain. The Saqqara bird was discovered in 1898 in a tomb in Saqqara, Egypt. It's roughly 2200 years old, and it looks like an airplane with a bird's head. Also, papyrus documents found near the artifact contain the phrase, I want to fly. That's led some people to hypothesize that the Saqqara bird is actually a model of a literal airplane that the ancient Egyptians either built themselves or saw someone else fly. And in fact, a couple of people have tested working replicas of the Saqqara bird, and they say it would have been capable of generating lift. Perhaps a full-size Saqqara bird could have flown. Sometimes these little projects kind of just prove what everyone wants them to prove, though, and not every reproduction of the Saqqara bird has had similarly impressive results. In 2002, a glider designer named Martin Gregory made a working model of the Saqqara bird. It demonstrated that in order to fly, the bird would have needed a tail wing stabilizer, which was missing on the original model. Even with that addition, it was still not particularly aerodynamic. That would lend weight to the theory that the Saqqara bird was just a toy that coincidentally happened to resemble an airplane. The Copper Scroll, or 3Q15, was the last of the 15 Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in Cave 3 at the Qumran archaeological site. It was obviously unique because it was written on metal, as the rest of the scrolls were written on parchment or papyrus. Furthermore, it was written in a different type of Hebrew than the other scrolls. Also, it wasn't a work of literature like the others, but a list. Specifically, it was a list of precious metals with a modern estimated value of around $1 billion. Also, it included directions to all 64 locations where the treasure could be found. Alas, the directions are vague and contain references to obscure locations like the old washer's chamber. To date, no one has been able to figure out exactly where those places are. Despite many treasure-seeking expeditions, the scroll has thus far failed to turn up a single hoard of silver and gold. The Great Serpent Mound in Ohio certainly seems like it must have had some purpose, but no one has more than a vague theory about what that purpose actually was. It's 1,300 feet long and 3 feet high, and it might have been built around 1070 AD. But it's hard to say for sure, since that date is based on radiocarbon testing of some charcoal found inside the mound. Also, there's no proof that the charcoal didn't end up there years or even centuries after the mound was built. The mound is made out of clay and ash and was reinforced with stone, and is generally thought to represent a serpent with an open mouth, which is about to eat an egg or possibly the sun. Other theorists think the mound actually represents an eclipse or phases of the moon. Research conducted in 1987 found that part of the mound is aligned to sunset at the summer solstice, which means it could have served as a calendar but it might have had a more sinister purpose, too. At one time, there was a blackened stone monument in the egg part of the mound, and since then, numerous headless skeletons were found buried nearby, as well as ceremonial knives and blackened stones. Gobekli Tepe is an 11,000-year-old site full of broken slabs of limestone in southeastern Turkey. It now sits in an empty, lifeless landscape, but at one time the land would have been full of water, fruit, and nut trees, and herds of wild animals. It was the sort of place that would have attracted human nomads, and it's possible that some of them decided to settle there and build a holy site. If that theory is true, it would change what we understand about the rise of civilization. It would mean that humans built temples before they developed agriculture, and we've assumed for a long time that those things happened in the opposite order. Not everyone agrees, though. Some archaeologists insist there's no evidence that anyone ever lived at Gobekli Tepe, and the carvings on the stones are fantastic and scary. Spiders, lions, snakes, and scorpions dominate. This might suggest that Gobekli Tepe wasn't a site of civilization, but simply a place where hunter-gatherers could symbolically confront the dangers of their world. Since the site predates written language by 6,000 years, though, once again we can only guess as to what might have been going on there 11,000 years ago. Inevitably, in archaeology, if we don't know what something is for, we think of ritual. But uh, really, it, it's pure speculation. The Berkeley Mystery Walls run across the California hills from Berkeley to San Jose. They're made from randomly sized boulders, some weighing up to a ton, and they run in strange broken sections. Some of the sections are only a few yards in length, while others are up to a half mile long. Some are in bizarre, inaccessible places, and none of them are really tall enough to have a utilitarian purpose. And since the mere existence of these walls isn't weird enough, they eventually lead to some strange stone circles and a 200-foot-wide spiral that encircles a large boulder. 
The first European settlers in California reported that the walls predated their arrival, and the local Ohlone tribe apparently said that the stones predated their arrival as well. Some people think they're a sign that an advanced civilization once lived in the Oakland Hills. Others think they were built by pre-European settlers from Mongolia, or by colonists who were left there by Sir Francis Drake. Those are all fun theories, and none of them can be definitively discounted. People see these things and they naturally wonder, well, why is that there? They create a story around it, and I think that's a natural human tendency. Archaeologists can spend months sifting through ridiculously small patches of dirt, meticulously recording everything they find. Months of backbreaking work might turn up some rare finds or end in disaster. But then drama. What is it? Are you mad, guy? We just found this here. How could you break it? So just imagine how annoyed archaeologists probably get when they leave a promising dig site empty-handed and then some kid in France falls into a hole only to find prehistoric cave paintings. A hard fact of the archaeologist's life is that great finds are sometimes accidentally discovered by common folk. Let's dust off our Indiana Jones costumes and take a gander at some of the strangest archaeological finds unearthed by chance. An Army for the Afterlife in 1974, while digging a well, a group of Chinese farmers discovered the first three of more than 7,000 life-size terracotta warriors guarding the tomb of China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. The terracotta army buried with the emperor is thought to be one of the greatest archaeological finds of all time. It's not only massive, it's full of individuals. Each of the 7,000 warriors has a unique face, beard, tunic, and armor. This curious fact has led some experts to speculate that craftsmen based each warrior on a living person, possibly a soldier in the emperor's real army. The soldiers were likely meant to protect him in the afterlife. Non-military personnel, like servants, scribes, and acrobats, were represented as well, suggesting that the emperor hoped the afterlife would be more or less the same as his actual life. Sadly, the terracotta army probably wasn't equipped to help protect the emperor from the crowds of tourists and roadside souvenir stands, but happy afterlife anyway. Renovation Excavation when Lucas Asacona Ramirez began scraping away plaster during a home renovation, he discovered an 18th century Mayan mural depicting people walking around with what appeared to be human hearts in their hands. In October 2012, Reuters reported that the Ramirez home is one of four in Ramirez's Guatemalan village where residents have uncovered ancient Mayan murals beneath the plaster, and experts think there could be murals in other homes too. Sadly, now that the murals have been exposed to light and humidity, the colors are starting to fade. That's one of the hazards of non-archaeologist archaeological discoveries. Unless someone with an interest in Mayan art shows up with a bag of mural-preserving supplies, the ancient murals will probably succumb to the elements in a relatively short period of time. A stone's throw Throwing rocks is almost never a productive activity. In fact, most people who chuck rocks are bored kids who end up breaking someone's window or their head. But in 1947, the world's most fruitful stone toss ended up breaking a piece of ancient pottery hidden in a Bedouin cave and exposing the Dead Sea Scrolls to the world. The scrolls were recovered by a shepherd who'd thrown a rock while chasing a stray sheep. He and his pals then took their discovery to an antique stealer in Bethlehem, who, in keeping with the sacred tradition of antique stealers being cheap schmucks, gave them the equivalent of about 29 bucks. 56 years later, they were sold for $250,000, and those shepherds are probably still out there hurling rocks around in hopes of finding the next big ancient artifact and hoping they don't make the same mistake twice. Gene Pool Deep Dive in 2007, divers exploring an underwater cave in Mexico's eastern Yucatan Peninsula found a human skeleton. Now, finding skeletons underwater isn't the most unusual thing ever, but this find was unusual because it came at the bottom of a cave that was literally called the Black Hole, about 170 feet underwater. Seeker reports that once the skeleton was in the hands of researchers, they discovered that it was the oldest known Native American ancestor, dated between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago. The girl, who was 15 or 16 years old at the time of her passing, probably walked into the cave and then fell into the deeper pit, which would have contained only a shallow pool of water. A few thousand years later, glacial melt filled the pit, submerging her bones and keeping them remarkably well-preserved until someone was finally able to solve the mystery of her tragic demise. Keeping up with the cave paintings In what is one of the most famous accidental discoveries of all time, four boys and a dog named Robot were out for a walk one day when they happened upon a fallen tree. 
Robot, being a dog, was all, hot damn, a hole, and started digging in a crevasse the tree had punched in the ground. The four boys joined him, imagining they might have found the entrance to a tunnel that would take them to a lost treasure. What they found was indeed a lost treasure, just not the kind you can stuff in your pockets and sell to an antiques dealer for $29. Instead, they discovered Lesko, a paleolithic cave filled with 20,000-year-old paintings made by early modern humans. The paintings are exquisitely detailed, and some of them are huge, more than 10 or 15 feet in length. In 1948, a year after their discovery, Lesko was open to the public, but 15 years later, someone finally realized that tourism was bad for the paintings. All of the carbon dioxide exhaled by thousands of visitors, along with contaminants they brought in on their shoes, was actually damaging the paintings, so the tours had to end. Fortunately, a full-scale replica of the cave, dubbed Lesko 4, was completed in 2016, allowing eager art lovers to get their prehistoric fix without doing irreparable damage to the ancient artwork. There are some puzzling details from antiquity that have had historians scratching their heads for years. Well, step aside, historians, because now we're on the case. Here's a look at some mysteries of ancient Rome that remain unsolved to this day. There's a village in western China where the residents have blue and green eyes, light hair, and a legend they're descended from a Roman legion. Are they? Here's what we know. In 53 BC, Marcus Crassus led a Roman force into what is now Iran, and almost his entire army was slaughtered. It's believed, though, that some escaped, and clues in ancient Chinese history books suggest that they may have become wandering mercenaries. Legend has it, they later settled down in China. In 2010, The Telegraph reported that DNA tests on the villagers of Liquan showed that they were indeed about 56% Caucasian. But are they descendants of Crassus's doomed legion? So far, that remains a mystery. Ham Hill is an Iron Age fort nestled in the scenic English countryside and for a few years it was the site of a joint archaeological dig overseen by the Universities of Cambridge and Cardiff. There, they found something horrible. Scores of human bodies, mostly women in their 20s who had been chopped up and stripped of their flesh. It's unclear just what happened at Ham Hill, but archaeologists suggest that some sort of brutal conflict took place there. Perhaps some Iron Age Britons even defleshed their kin as part of their burial rituals. We don't know, but just remember Ham Hill the next time you think you want to go back in time to live a simpler life. In 2010, archaeologists from the University of Michigan uncovered a mysterious 1,000-pound lead coffin buried in the city of Gabby. Clearly, someone had gone to huge lengths to give this person an elaborate funeral, securing their earthly remains in a sheet of lead folded carefully into a coffin in a shape that gave it the nickname Lead Burrito. Archaeologist Nicola Terranato said lead coffins were rare and that one that heavy would have cost a fortune. Unfortunately, when researchers used non-invasive techniques to see what artifacts were buried with the man, it turned out that there was nothing at all. And without any other burial objects to give them clues, everyone is still in the dark about who this person was and why they were buried inside a burrito. The survivors of Marcus Crassus's doomed army aren't the only famous troop of Roman soldiers to vanish without a trace. There's also the famous case of the 9th Legion, a unit said to be the best of the best, so deadly that it was sent to the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire to deal with the rebellious Picts in northern England. And then they just… disappeared. According to the BBC, the theory they all died beyond Hadrian's Wall was popularized by Rosemary Sutcliffe's novel, The Eagle of the Ninth. However, that doesn't quite seem to be true. The last official mention of the Ninth Legion was in the year 108 AD, and the historian Titus wrote that the Ninth did suffer massive losses in the lands beyond Hadrian's Wall. We also know that around the year 118, the Sixth Legion was transferred to the Wall, presumably to replace the fallen Ninth. That all checks out with legend. However, bricks have been unearthed in the Netherlands that were stamped with the 9th Legion's mark and dated to the year 121. And in the year 142, an officer from the 9th shows up in records as the governor of Arabia, of all places. So what really happened to the 9th? Were they simply transferred back out of England after getting their butts whooped? Historians have a number of competing theories about where they may have actually ended up, but nobody knows the truth. In 1988, 39 skulls from the Roman era were excavated at a site near the Museum of London, and it was initially thought that the skulls may have been washed downriver from a burial ground or something. But in 2015, 
The Guardian reported that new finds, including a pot filled with cremated human remains, suggested something more sinister. That the skulls had been deliberately placed together on the riverbank as some sort of warning, or even as trophies. And we're still trying to understand the scale of the carnage. Lead archaeologist Jay Carver said that over the past two centuries, there had in fact been hundreds of skulls found near the dig. Confusing the matter, though, are an additional 2,500 skeletons dumped at the site during the Great Plague of 1665, so figuring out just what happened when and to whom remains a tall task. There's a huge amount of Roman history we only know because of Titus Livius, otherwise known as Livy. The ancient history encyclopedia even goes as far as crediting him as being the reason the Roman Empire was remembered. A lofty claim that makes it even weirder that we know next to nothing about him. We know he was born in Petuvia, ended up in Rome, and had at least a son and a daughter, and that's pretty much it. Oh, and we know that his claim to fame even at the time was his massive 142-volume history spanning the years from the founding of Rome into Imperial Rome. A whole seven centuries condensed into a set of books you'd need at least a few donkeys to carry. Unfortunately, though, most of the history has been completely lost. The only books that survived in their entirety were the first ten volumes and volumes 21 through 45. We also have a short synopsis for most of the others, though two are gone completely. Who knows what else we would have learned about the Roman Empire? Heck, maybe even some of these other mysteries would have made sense if only we had Livy's history to explain them to us. The ancient Romans are famous for feasting and drinking, whether it's obsessing over who sits where on the giant couches, deciding to eat snails or peacocks, or making a power play on your rivals. Roman parties were one of a kind. Here's what it was really like to party like an ancient Roman. As opposed to larger public festivals, the Roman dinner party, known as the Convivium, generally took place in a private home. These dinner parties were held in residences with attendance from a small group of friends, family, and business associates, though they were still designed to be extravagant and impressive. The most common reception room for such parties was the dining area, which in Roman homes were known as the three couch room. This is because dining was typically done while reclining on, you guessed it, couches. They were arranged in a U-shape with a table in the middle in order to facilitate sharing and conversation. As these entertaining spaces were meant to be a delight to the senses, an upper-class shindig would often feature plenty of decorative elements, such as floor mosaics, sculptures, or other pieces of art and fancy furniture. While the Greeks were known to enjoy drinking parties such as symposia, Roman dinner parties were different in a number of ways. The chief difference is that women were allowed to attend Roman gatherings, providing that they were of an appropriate class. At the Greek symposia, the only women allowed were entertainers, musicians, or sex workers. If you were Roman, at least married women could attend with their spouses. For aristocratic Romans, especially political figures like the emperor, lavish banquets were essential political tools for garnering favor and accumulating power. These extravagant dinner parties were a way for Rome's elite to show off their wealth, network with the powerful, and intimidate their enemies. The ulterior motives were even more important for emperors. Using parties, they were able to display their power, offer gifts to those who might bestow upon them political favor, and keep an eye on their political rivals. Occasionally, assassination was on the events list. While actual evidence of poisoning at parties is rare, Roman dignitaries always got suspicious when someone took sick after a party. A notable example is when the son of Emperor Claudius died after a party and suspicion naturally fell on Nero, who stood to benefit the most from the death of Claudius' heir. For the most part, however, the goal of such lavish banquets was not murder, but rather buying favor with an epic bash. Since the goal of a Roman banquet was often political or business-oriented in nature, it makes sense that the seating chart would be an essential aspect of preparation. High-powered guests could be flattered with a seat of honor, while the host could secure himself unfettered access to an influential guest during dinner. The three couches of the Roman party room represented different tiers of respect. The most honored guests would recline on the couch that formed the center of the U-shape, while the host would lie to the right. Less important guests would lie on the leftmost couch, somewhat ironically known as the high couch. By seating the guests of honor on the middle couch, the host not only assured that these guests would be the center of attention for anyone entering the room, but they also made sure that these important diners got the best view of the party, typically of the host's courtyard or garden. The low-status guests would have to settle for staring at the dining room's expensive and extravagant wall art. As time went on, parties got bigger and more elaborate, so hosts needed more elaborate couch installations. The traditional three-couch setup ended up being replaced by a huge semicircular couch that could hold up to 12 people. 
Besides the fact that women were allowed to be guests, another thing that distinguished a Roman party from a Greek event was that wine flowed freely at every stage of a Roman bash. It was generally considered gauche by both Greeks and Romans to drink wine that had not been mixed with water. So at dinner parties, each guest's wine would be mixed with water to taste in their individual cups. Wine was served in the drinking cup with a ladle, which allowed for exact measurements by attractive, often nude male slaves. Depending on the party, hot or cold water would then be mixed in. The Romans used special boilers to heat their mixing water. If a host really wanted to show off, they might add snow to the wine. The cups of the Roman elite were typically made of silver, and while there are multiple varieties of cups in the archaeological record, the most common types were two-handled cups modeled off the Greek style. More ornate cups were decorated with reliefs depicting floral motifs, erotic scenes, or mythological subjects, including, of course, Bacchus, the god of wine. A typical Roman banquet was made up of three courses, the hors d'oeuvres, the main course, and the dessert. Since most dinner parties were meant to impress, the food was generally a spectacle designed to engage all of the senses. Exotic foods were common, as their rarity, high cost, and difficulty in preparing were a part of the appeal. They put the wealth, taste, and tenacity of the host front and center. Popular dishes included oysters, wild boar, venison, pheasant, lobsters, peacock, and basically any kind of songbird you can imagine. Illegal foods such as sow's udders and fattened up poultry were common at these elite affairs. A Roman author named Apicius recorded the only still surviving cookbook from the Roman Empire's hundreds of recipes. They include such outlandish dishes as parrots, goose liver, camel heels, flamingo, cranes, ostrich, coxcombs, sausages stuffed with brains, crawfish stuffed with caviar, and snails. Snails, as it turns out, were eaten so commonly that there were actually special spoons made just for eating them. There were also recipes for normal stuff like vegetables and beans, but who cares about that in the face of honey-smeared nightingales stuffed with prunes? Apicius was so in love with his recipes that he spent all his money on fancy food and ultimately died bankrupt. Roman banquets were often the place of all sorts of entertainment, some of which we might even consider deranged by today's standards. A very common element at dinner parties was musical accompaniment in the form of flutes, water organs, lyres, or even choirs. If your party mood was a little less adults enjoying wine and cheese and a little more hype, you might hire the services of acrobats, dancing girls, mimes, or maybe even a stand-up philosopher or two. Good evening, ladies and emperors! I just got back from Venice, and boy, are my arms tired! But if you wanted the party to really get lit, you'd take it to the next level. If your appetite was as much for blood as wine, you might bring in trained exotic animals or have a gladiatorial battle. To give your party a chill vibe, you might consider options like having poetry readings or recitations of history. The cheapest option might be just having your slaves sing as they serve the food and wine. There's one particularly indulgent and probably apocryphal story of a Roman party that went way too far. The famously extravagant emperor Elagabalus wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a dining hall with a false ceiling that was then filled with them. When the ceiling was tilted open, a flood of petals fell heavily upon the guests and smothered them to death. While Roman dinner parties are infamous for their excess, at least one aspect of them has been exaggerated in modern culture. It's a common belief in popular culture that the Romans had a special room called the vomitorium, where they would go during dinner parties in order to purge their bellies so they could make room to indulge in more food. Modern authors as varied as Aldous Huxley and Suzanne Collins have often discussed the vomitorium as a literal place in the home, as a symbol of Roman excess, indulgence, and disgusting luxury. But there was not, in fact, a dedicated purge and rally room in Roman homes. Vomitorium was a word in classical Latin, possibly coined by the writer Macrobius. He wasn't talking about a puke room, though. He was describing the entrances and exits at stadiums and theaters, which resembled someone throwing up in the way that people poured out of them and into the streets or seats. It was a weird kind of intentionally gross metaphor. But sometime in the 19th century, people started taking the word literally and applied it to their pre-existing notion of the Romans as an indulgent and gluttonous people. In this case, truth is not stranger than fiction. While the Roman convivium was a private and even exclusive affair, it was not the only kind of dinner party to be found in ancient Rome. There were also public feasts with religious rather than social or political purposes. As opposed to private parties, these public events were civic banquets open to all the citizens of the city. They frequently played host to enormous numbers of diners. When one of these public parties had a specific religious focus, food offerings were made to the gods who were generally present in the form of statues. One of the most notable of these public religious feasts was the Feast of Jupiter. This banquet was celebrated every September 13th, the Ides of September, and was originally held for the dedication of the Temple of the Capitoline Hill. 
Seven priests, whose job was overseeing the public feast, would sacrifice a white heifer and then invite the gods to feast. Statues of the gods were placed on couches bedecked with the most splendid of coverings. While initially only the Capitoline Triad took part in this feast, by the 3rd century BCE, all 12 Olympian gods were present in the form of statues chilling on couches. Even today, the word bacchanalia is used to refer to a riotous drunken party, often aimed at boisterous fraternity or sorority parties. Toga, 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 toga. This reputation for bacchanalia goes back to the ancient times as well. A bacchanal is a celebration of the god Bacchus, the Greco-Roman god of wine and fertility. Roman bacchanalia were based on various Greek rites, which, depending on location, could include drunken feasts, ritual parades, dramatic performances, or carrying clusters of grapes around. These Greek fertility rituals were introduced to Rome through Greek provinces in southern Italy. The Italian bacchanalia were initially celebrated only by women and were held three times a year during the day. However, before long, men were admitted as well, and the rites were held at night as often as five times a month. The rituals were private, and like most ancient mystery cults, we don't actually have much information about them. What we do know is that men and women getting together in big groups at night to drink wine and party caused a huge scandal among the Romans. Rumors that the Bacchanalia included orgies and even human sacrifices led to the Senate passing a ban on the parties throughout all of Italy in 186 BCE. Despite this decree, these celebrations continued covertly in southern Italy for many years. There was no shortage of Roman holidays, with some state holiday, religious feast, or public game being held practically every other day on the Roman calendar. They celebrated everything from fertility to driving out the shades of the evil dead. But the most popular Roman religious festival was Saturnalia, the midwinter festival celebrating Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture. By the late Republic, Saturnalia had expanded from a single-day festival to a week-long affair stretching from December 17th to December 25th, and its influence is thought to be felt in modern Christmas celebrations. Saturnalia represented an upending of standard social order. Businesses and schools closed, work was forbidden, and slaves and masters traded places. Well, kind of. Masters would serve their slaves, who would sit at the head of the table and take part in the holiday festivals. Houses would be decorated with wreaths and greenery, and colorful clothes were worn. Gambling was temporarily legalized, and singing, feasting, socializing, and gift-giving were standard celebrations. A common Saturnalia gift was candles, which represented the return of sunlight after the winter solstice. Houses would elect a leader of Saturnalia, a lord of misrule, to oversee the chaos represented by this joyous, raucous, topsy-turvy time. From a modern perspective, Roman emperors have a reputation as pampered libertines. A classic example being portrayals of Nero lying on the couch and being fed grapes while Rome burns around him. This wasn't true of all Roman leaders. Julius Caesar, his heir Augustus, and Stoic philosopher King Marcus Aurelius were all famous for their simple diets in moderation. However, the reputation for debauchery was earned by some, like Elagabalus, who swam in a saffron swimming pool and served his guests rice mixed with pearl. But we need to be shut off! Especially you, hedonism bot! I apologize for nothing! But perhaps the most famously debauched Roman emperor of them all was the infamous emperor Caligula. Caligula is known even today for his wild fits of spendthrift waste and capricious violence. He was enormously egotistical, wanton, and hedonistic. His personal and financial excesses led to his being assassinated after four years on the throne. He was not the first and hardly the last Roman emperor to be assassinated. But before that, he would hold his violently orgiastic parties on luxury barges described as being blazed with jewels and filled with ample baths, galleries, and saloons, and supplied with a great variety of vines and fruit trees. These boats were deliberately sunk after Caligula's assassination, and researchers have been trying to find them for the last several decades after some of Caligula's other ships were discovered in the 1920s. But so far, no luck, which, given his reputation, is maybe just as well. Lost cities, secret royals, and the most lavish tombs in history. These are the discoveries that changed everything we know about ancient Egypt. For the dead of ancient Egypt, it wasn't enough to be mummified. You had to be laid to rest in style. Ideally, this included a respectable tomb and items meant to make their afterlife easier, such as jewelry, food, and shopsy dolls intended to spring to life as servants in the hereafter. Most Egyptians of means, however, would also have wanted an especially resplendent coffin. Coffins not only helped to preserve a body, but also carried vital symbols and magical spells meant to streamline the transition into the afterlife. Eventually, coffins began to depict the deceased as gods themselves. 
The bigger the funerary budget, the finer the artwork and the materials used. By that reasoning, the gigantic stone sarcophagus uncovered by researchers at Saqqara in late 2021 must have belonged to a pretty high-ranking Egyptian. Luckily, his identity wasn't much of a mystery. Excavators could read the carvings all over the piece that indicated it was meant for Ptahmuia, the treasurer of Ramses II. Even more dramatically, the huge artifact was found at the bottom of a shaft nearly 30 feet deep. To find a sarcophagus in its original spot is exceptionally unusual, and it could reveal yet more about the inner workings of the court of Ramses the Great. It seems strange to think of an entire city disappearing, especially for a society that is so well known for its use of historical documentation. There certainly had been some records of the city of Aten, constructed during the reign of Pharaoh Amenhotep III in the 14th century BC, but it then seemingly vanished into the desert near modern-day Luxor. In an April 2021 statement announcing the rediscovery of the city, Egyptologist and former antiquities official Dr. Zahi Hawass noted that numerous foreign groups had tried and failed to find it in the past. It was an Egyptian team that finally traced its location during an attempt to uncover the mortuary temple of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. Egyptologist professor Salima Ikram later told the BBC, You expect some ancient Egyptian to just come around the corner and greet you. It's, it's really stepping into the past. Aten wasn't just some backwater town either. This sprawling settlement was a major population center that arose during the most prosperous era of the kingdom. Among the finds was what appears to have been an industrial level kitchen, a residential area that sported a unique zigzag shaped wall, and a production facility for mud bricks, which bore the mark of Amenhotep himself. There are even tantalizing hints of the transition from polytheism to the monotheistic worship of the sun disk, established by Amenhotep's son and successor, Akhenaten. Further excavation will hopefully reveal more about this dramatic period of Egyptian history. The Giza pyramids are about 4,500 years old, but a civilization doesn't simply spring up out of nowhere and go about building 500-foot-tall monuments. Many people lived during the pre-dynastic period of ancient Egypt, generations before the pharaohs. This era of history saw a few different cultures appear, many of which didn't seem too worried about the centralization of authority. Perhaps because of their simple structures and largely unadorned graves, much remains unknown about some of the earliest Egyptians. Then, in 2020, an Egyptian team announced its discovery of 83 ancient graves, many of which were about 6,000 years old and date from the Budo period. Budo was an ancient city in the north of Egypt, traditionally known as Lower Egypt, given the south-to-north flow of the Nile River. Other graves are slightly younger, dating to the Nakata III period, which lasted from about 3200 to 3000 BC. By the end of this era, Egyptians were likely experiencing the first rumblings of political organization, eventually leading to the rule of the pharaohs. Saqqara, a vast and stunning ancient necropolis, has proved to be a rich site for archaeologists in recent years. It was even a tourist attraction for many generations, although it was in pretty rough shape by the 19th century. Nevertheless, Egyptologists have continued making remarkable new finds there, from extravagant tombs to unique animal mummies. In September 2020, a team started to uncover a group of so-called megatombs. These burial places were dominated by gigantic coffins made out of carefully carved and decorated wood. A gilded one. I have never seen a girl that face in a great condition like this one. Eventually, excavators unearthed well over 100 coffins in the largest grouping of burials ever found in Egypt. Group burials had become common when the kingdom faced serious political instability. Even though many were buried here during a resurgence of Egyptian power, by that time, group burials had become the norm. This idea may even have been linked to the worship of long-dead royals, and being buried near a well-known Egyptian might have been believed to confer protection on the dead. It's no secret that many, if not most, of the pharaohs thought pretty highly of themselves. They lived the good life, dining on fine foods, decking themselves out in rare jewels, and ordering the construction of huge monuments dedicated to their legacy. They also frequently proclaimed themselves to be nothing less than gods, given the weighty task of maintaining cosmic order and managing the regular humans in their realm. With all that high-flying divine rhetoric threaded through Egyptian history, it's no wonder that some rulers were worshipped after their death. In 2022, evidence was uncovered that revealed more information about an especially long-lived cult centered around King Teddy, 
who was buried in a pyramid in the Saqqara necropolis more than 4,000 years ago. It apparently wasn't an especially restful tomb, however, as people clamored for 1,000 years to be buried near him after his death. Evidence of Teddy's mortuary cult had been available for years, but the new find has shed light on the notion that a burial spot near Teddy was thought to confer protection on the deceased, even if they were only a humdrum rich person and not a semi-immortal god-king. By 2022, it was already abundantly clear that Saqqara was one of the hottest spots on Earth, at least as far as Egyptologists were concerned. Any Egyptologist must come to Saqqara to learn the history from the beginning till the end. The ancient necropolis was teeming with burials and grave goods, not to mention active excavations, and it has hardly been depleted over the years. In May 2022, archaeologists revealed yet another massive find, this time an estimated 250 elaborately decorated coffins. As impressive and tantalizing as a mound of unopened sarcophagi may seem on its own, there was more about this discovery to draw attention from across the globe. The reveal included about 150 statues of different ancient gods, including major figures such as the underworld king Osiris, his wife Isis, and the goddess of love and sensuality, Hathor. One grave even contained well-preserved wooden statues of the goddesses Isis and Nephthys, posed to mourn the dead individual. Previously, archaeologists had assumed that the site was primarily dedicated to the goddess Bast, most often depicted as a cat. However, this new cache of coffins and religious objects makes it clear that there's a more complex picture of Saqqara waiting to be revealed. Among the May 2022 trove of coffins excavated at the Saqqara burial complex was one particularly special find. One of these sarcophagi contained a powerful and hugely important text known as the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead was a big deal for Egyptians. It's actually a collection of texts by multiple authors. All forms of the Book of the Dead contain spells and advice for the deceased who was expected to make a dangerous journey to the afterworld. Quotes from the Book of the Dead are so important that they're often found in mummy wrappings, on tomb walls, and inscribed into coffins. With the help of the spells, the departed would hopefully make it past a series of challenges and spend their afterlife chilling with the gods. The man buried with this 13-foot scroll wasn't in possession of the whole text, but a significant excerpt known today as Chapter 17. This is one of the longest parts of the book and, strikingly, compares the dead to many major deities. Given how central the Book of the Dead is to Egyptian belief, a new copy of any portion can reveal more about how these ancient people thought about life after death. Many Egyptian royals seem preoccupied with their legacy. Ramses II certainly appeared to think he was Ramses the Great during his lifetime, if his zeal for building monuments full of oversized self-portraits is any indication. And while Ramses may have been the pharaoh with the most building projects to his name, he definitely wasn't alone in his self-regard. Across Egypt, countless tombs, statues, obelisks, temples, palaces, and more sport the names of the rulers who ordered their construction. So it's all the more strange that some of them still managed to be forgotten, or at least partially so. Take the semi-mythical Scorpion King, for example. No, not that one. The Scorpion King was likely a real pharaoh that managed to unite the disparate fiefdoms of early Egypt, but his actual name still evades us. If even he could be lost to time, where's the hope for lesser-known royals, such as the queens of Egypt? But as a recent discovery made clear, names and identities can resurface. In January 2021, Egypt's Antiquities Ministry and Dr. Zahi Hawass announced another round of discoveries at the Saqqara Necropolis. Among the many finds was a mortuary temple dedicated to Queen Nirit, wife of King Teddy. She's also known as Neat, whatever you call her though. This queen is all the more remarkable since, as Hawass admitted, even he had never known she existed. Tattooing has been around for a very, very long time. For example, Utzi, the Alpine Iceman mummy who died around 3300 BC, is the oldest confirmed person to sport tattoos, an impressive 57 of them in fact. So, tattooing likely wasn't all that shocking to the ancient Egyptians. As a 2022 study published in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology argued, the practice may have even been considered essential. Researchers found figurines with tattoo-like markings and two female mummies with identifiable tattoos in the ancient village of Deir el-Medina. Tattooed mummies are pretty unusual, 
As imaging techniques have a hard time uncovering the markings beneath linen wrappings, and archaeologists now very rarely unwrap mummies. In the wake of the Deir el Medina discovery, researchers were able to describe the remains of two tattooed women, one whose left hip sported an image of Bess, a dwarf-like god, and another who was marked with the protective eye of Horus, and possibly another depiction of Bess. The imagery suggests that these tattoos were meant to protect women as they moved through the perilous time of pregnancy and childbirth. This discovery adds to a small but growing body of evidence that ancient Egyptians were definitely down with tattooing. Many ancient Egyptians loved gold. Need proof? Just look at any royal burial that hasn't already been looted to oblivion. The spectacular 1922 excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb uncovered a hoard of golden artifacts that surely captivated the ancients as much as it does us. Yet Egyptians of old and modern folks may have a few differences of opinion regarding the use of gold. In 2021, a Spanish team opened a 2,500-year-old tomb south of Cairo. This discovery was especially exciting because the tomb was still sealed. Inside was a male mummy in a stone sarcophagus and hundreds of small Shabti figures meant to serve the deceased in the afterlife. Another tomb, belonging to a woman, had been broken into. Just outside these burial places, archaeologists found three golden tongues from the Roman occupation of Egypt. Unusual as it may seem to us, the ancients felt that these artifacts were vital in allowing the dead to communicate with the god Osiris. Given all of the incantations and other pronouncements necessary to pass divine muster and make it to paradise, why not give a dead loved one an advantage? These make up just one part of a group of similar artifacts that could reveal more about this later period of ancient Egyptian history. In ancient Greece, the saying, don't do the crime if you can't do the time, didn't necessarily apply. Greeks in the classical era didn't use prison as a long-term solution for dealing with convicted criminals. Let's take a look at what punishments they had in store. Turns out that imprisonment as we know it, as a form of punishment, was extremely rare in ancient Greece. For the Athenians, the Greeks whom we know the most about, it really didn't exist at all. They had other, more preferred forms of punishment that they considered less of a hassle, which we're going to be discussing. But people were sometimes jailed in ancient Greece. The main reasons for imprisonment were pre-trial or pre-execution detention. For these detentions, Athens had a dedicated building referred to as the Desmotyrion. Still, a person awaiting trial or execution might not be sent there and instead simply be put under strict surveillance. Because ancient Greeks thought about punishment in a different way than we do, their views on prison were different too. Whereas nowadays, prison sentences are usually served for reform, retribution for a crime committed, or to deter more wrongdoing, for the Greeks, punishment in prison were mainly about seeking redress for the victim. In fact, the Athenians didn't have a public district attorney to bring criminal cases before the state. In the vast majority of Athenian criminal court cases from the era we still have record of, the charges were brought before the court by the victim himself. So for the Athenians, anger was the basis of law. But what sort of punishments were actually used to appease that anger? According to the Center for Hellenic Studies, that depended on the severity of the crime. Some of the most common included fines, public humiliation in the stocks for a set period of time, and temporary or total loss of civic freedom such as voting. The Greeks also had nastier punishments, including confiscation of property, even to the extent of straight up burning down a person's house, banishment from the city, and of course, death. As for imprisonment, it wasn't really a direct punishment for criminal offense, usually just ordered when sentenced people had to pay fines but couldn't afford them. In fact, exile was the most prominent punishment for serious crimes in Greece. Exile served roughly the same purpose that prison does for us, removing wrongdoers from society. But not every person living within the confines of Athens was afforded the luxury of the state penal system when a crime was committed. That was because of the strict class division between landholding adult males and everyone else. As the Center for Hellenic Studies says, women had no political rights to lose, so their punishments for crimes were commonly losing access to temples and religious festivals. They could serve on juries, but if called as defendants, men would have to speak on their behalf. Male non-citizens residing in Athens could be subject to any of the male citizen punishments like fines and the stocks, but they couldn't be disenfranchised since they had no voting rights. Slaves, of course, incurred the harshest penalties of all. If a slave was convicted of a crime, the master might be fined and the slave would be executed. The less severe punishments were whippings, beatings, and imprisonment in mill houses. 
Like it is today, murder was a big deal in ancient Greece. In fact, the Greeks thought it had to be atoned for thoroughly or it would undermine the entire community. As Mythology Unbound explains it, this blood guilt was known as miasma, a sort of god-sent contagion resulting from murder. According to the newspaper Ani Swa at the University of Sydney, this guilt infected the perpetrator and anyone who came in contact with him or her. The only way to remove the stain of miasma was by exiling the wrongdoer and conducting a purge outside the community. This curse of blood guilt is at the center of a number of prominent Greek myths and dramas, most notably the Oedipus and Oresteia trilogies. The ancient Athenians generally reserved the death penalty for the most serious of crimes, including murder, blasphemy, and corrupting public morals, the last of which was used in the conviction of the famous philosopher Socrates, whom we'll get to a bit more later. Socrates? Hey, we know that name. Yeah! Hey! Look him up! This restricted use of the death penalty wasn't always the case, however. As Ancient World Magazine explains, the earliest known written laws of the Athenians, devised by the lawgiver Dracon, proposed death as a punishment for just about any crime, hence our modern term draconian, referring to a particularly strict set of laws or rules. However, by the classical era, even manslaughter was typically punished by exile rather than execution. There were three typical methods of execution we're aware of. The first was throwing people into a deep pit, though this was out of fashion by the 4th century BCE. The next, and probably most common, was a little understood device called the tympanon, a board of some kind to which a criminal was fastened and, depending on various modern interpretations, was either beaten to death, exposed to the elements, or strangled in a kind of bloodless crucifixion. The third method is probably the most famous because of its use on Socrates, drinking hemlock, a deadly poison. Yet despite its renown, this method was rarely used, due in part to the great expense of procuring hemlock. Just because the Athenians didn't typically use prison as a major form of criminal punishment doesn't mean it was out of their minds. In fact, one of Athenians' most famous thinkers, the philosopher Plato, a pupil of Socrates, theorized at some length about the very subject in his last, longest philosophical work, The Laws. In this dialogue, three men, an Athenian, a Spartan, and a Cretan, worked together trying to create a set of laws for a new Cretan colony called Magnesia. In typical Platonic fashion, the three men apply discussions on ethics, theology, and metaphysics to practical concerns of legislation, such as rules on drunkenness, hunting, and whether or not you can prosecute suicide. In Book 9, the discussion turns to the topics of justice and punishment. The Athenian proposes six forms of punishment, including death, exile, and an innovation for the time, imprisonment. He proposes three types of prisons within the state, each suggesting a different level of penal severity. One, a common prison within the city center for general offenders. Next, the House of Reformation for those whose crimes are judged to be the result of ignorance rather than malice. And finally, an isolated prison in the wilderness where the offender is permanently exiled. Since we know from the records of various law cases in Athens, there was in fact a public building that served as a dedicated prison space, what was that building actually like? Well, thanks to archaeology, we might have a pretty good idea. As Harry's Greece Travel Guide explains, in the southwest corner of the Athenian Agora, there are the ruins of a building that might just have been the Athenian Desmatorium. The building is surrounded by workshops and homes, but the fact it wasn't simply another house or workshop is evidenced by its unusual floor plan. That's because most homes in ancient Greece and Rome feature rooms laid out around a central courtyard, whereas this building is made up of a long hallway with five rooms on one side and three on the other. It seems likely that these were the eight holding cells of the Athenian jailhouse. One room at the end of the corridor has a large earthenware jar for water, suggesting that it was a bathroom of some kind, while another room has a cistern into which 13 small bottles had been thrown after use. These bottles are believed to have contained the hemlock used in the execution of some criminals. It is entirely likely that this was the very building where Socrates died. Because classical Athens didn't have a public prosecutor, any citizen could bring charges against someone they felt had wronged them. The complainant would deliver a summons orally in the presence of witnesses, who would then require the accused to appear before a judicial magistrate known as a King Archon at a particular date and time. The Archon would subsequently hear both sides of the issue and decide if the lawsuit was valid under the law. If so, a preliminary hearing would take place in front of the magistrate, where the charge and the defense were both read out, followed by a round of questions from the magistrate. If the magistrate found the accusation to be sound, formal charges and a public trial date would be set. The trial would take place in front of an enormous jury between 500 and 1,500 male citizens over the age of 30, chosen at random from a pool of volunteers. Pretty democratic. Silence! Violence for the hero of Marathon! This is a democracy, not a street fight. The charges would be read again, at which point the defendant would have the chance to answer them. 
The jury would then vote, first on the defendant's guilt and then, in the case of a conviction, on the sentencing, deciding between punishments suggested by both the accuser and the defendant. Though the Athenians had the death penalty, they were pretty lenient in carrying out punishments, including the death penalty according to the Center for Hellenic Studies. In most cases, even murder, exile was often considered a harsh enough punishment, so convicts scheduled for execution were often given an opportunity to escape to another country. It was, in fact, expected that convicted felons would break out of prison. It was such an expected part of the process that there was even the option given to a defendant on trial for murder simply to leave the country rather than to risk the death penalty. Part of the reason Athens was so willing and even eager to let a prisoner on death row escape had to do with the concept of miasma or blood guilt. The thinking was, better to avoid having someone's blood on your hands if you could manage it. It was reflected in their relatively bloodless methods of execution – pit, poison, strangulation on a weird device. But the safest way not to bring a blood curse on your city is not to kill someone at all. The most famous trial in Greek history is that of philosopher Socrates, who was put on trial in Athens in 399 BCE. As Famous Trials points out, the trial was notable because it was a capital trial not over murder, but rather over corrupting the morals of Athenian youth through the teaching of philosophy. While most of what we know about Socrates comes through the writings of his students Plato and Xenophon, the comedic play The Clouds by Socrates' friends Aristophanes gives us a pretty good idea of the public's perception of Socrates – eccentric, dreamy, and condescending. Opinions turned darker when some of his former students became terrifying tyrants, which suddenly made Socrates' teaching seem more dangerous than charmingly eccentric. It was the poet Miletus who drew up the official charges against Socrates, claiming that his teachings had a corrupting and undemocratic influence on the youth of the day. The trial took place over the course of about 10 hours in the People's Courts in front of a jury of 500 men. His accusers spent their three allotted hours pointing out Socrates' alleged political sins and religious blasphemies, such as saying the sun and moon weren't gods, but rather celestial bodies. All we are is dust in the wind, dude. Socrates' response to his accusers is one of the most famous legal speeches in history, with versions recorded by both Plato and Xenophon, though Plato's is the better known. The speech is known as the Apology, but it's important to understand that in Greek, this word means defense, because Socrates was anything but meek in addressing his accusers, whom he mocks and corrects over the course of his speech. According to famous trials, Socrates didn't even ask for mercy, as most defendants would have done. He said that begging for one's life was a disgrace both to oneself and to the justice system. In the end, Socrates was found guilty, 280 votes to 220. When the penalty phase of the trial began, it was time for each side to propose a punishment. Miletus and the others skipped exile entirely and proposed death. Socrates, spiteful of the entire process, suggested that his punishment be the state buying him dinner every day for the rest of his life. When forced to pick a real punishment, he proposed a nominal fee. This mockery of the system upset the jurors more than his crime, so he was sentenced to death by a vote of 360 to 140. Unwilling to flee his fate, Socrates drank hemlock in his prison cell and died in 399 BCE. The mummies of ancient Egypt were essential spiritual vehicles. Consequently, the embalmers of mummies loom large in Egyptian civilization. Yet little is known about them, though recent discoveries have shed new light. Keep watching to discover what it was really like to be an ancient Egyptian embalmer. To understand what life was like for an ancient Egyptian embalmer, you need to know about Egyptian religious beliefs. Egyptians believed that a person needed to live in harmony with the cosmic order. After a person died, they were judged by Osiris, the Egyptian god of death. Their heart was weighed against the feather. If it was lighter, then their spirit, which was known by the term Ka, would pass on to an afterlife in the field of reeds. But if people's hearts were too heavy, they'd be devoured by Amet, a crocodile-shaped goddess. The field of reeds was a mirror image of the physical world. Ka wasn't an ethereal thing, instead it was intertwined with the physical body. Both were needed to pass into the field of reeds. According to Egyptologist Rita Lucarelli, the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with the afterlife. They believed that there is another life after life here on Earth. This was modeled on the myth of the rebirth of Osiris. Thus, the idea of embalming by preserving the dead body through mummification was born. Mummification started by accident. The arid Egyptian environment is very conducive to mummification. The first Egyptian mummies were probably bodies dried out in graves dug in the sand through natural processes. The resulting well-preserved corpses were seen as an inspiring sign from the gods that this is how the dead should be treated. As Egyptian society developed, people began to place the bodies of their rulers within sarcophagi and tombs. However, bodies don't preserve as well in tombs as they do in dry desert sands. 
So embalmers had to develop the techniques they needed for mummification. By about 2600 BC, Egyptians probably started to embalm the dead on purpose. This practice began with royalty and continued for over two millennia. Egyptian pharaohs were considered to be divinely appointed and acted as the intermediary of the gods. For the embalmers, this meant that their work was a sacred act, so their job associated them with the priesthood and granted them high status. The exact details of how Egyptian embalmers mummified the dead is a trade secret that's still being pieced together by archaeologists. There aren't any existing Egyptian technical manuals on the subject, though the ancient Greeks did write about it. The first account is by Herodotus, who wrote about embalmers in 430 BC in his histories. Embalmers first needed to remove the internal organs, which easily decayed. The process began by taking the body to a temporary building where the embalmers took an iron hook, inserted it up into the cadaver's nostril, and penetrated the brain cavity. A good embalmer tried very hard not to break the nose, though sometimes it was unavoidable. Once done, the hook was used to swirl around the gray matter and extract it. The brain bits were discarded since the Egyptians believed that the brain was useless. If I only had a brain. Instead, they believed that the heart was the source of a person's individuality, including their intelligence, wisdom, and personality. According to Grafton Elliott Smith and Warren R. Dawson's classic account of embalming, after the brain was tossed out, work on the body proper began. A scribe marked where to cut an opening on the corpse's side. Cutters or slitters did this work with an obsidian knife. Then the lungs, liver, intestines, and all other organs except the kidneys and heart were removed. These cutters were actually not embalmers, since the work they did was considered desecration. They were of much lower status, and after they finished their work, they fled the scene, having objects and curses hurled at them as a matter of ceremony. Uh, uh, the embalmers then began the preservation process. They removed the remaining organs and cleared out the body cavity and washed the body out with substances including palm wine. Then, in order to counter any odor from putrefaction, they applied liberal amounts of aromatics such as myrrh and cinnamon. Meanwhile, organs that had been removed were washed with palm wine and placed in jars for preservation. When all was done, the heart was placed back inside the body, as the dead needed their hearts for when Osiris judged them. In later years, the heart was replaced with a scarab, symbolizing Osiris' rebirth. Meanwhile, the kidneys, which were considered unimportant, were most likely left inside the body. After the organ removal, the embalmers would dry the corpse with natron, a form of naturally occurring salt that the Egyptians harvested from lake beds. Embalmers would both bury the body with natron and insert packets of it inside the body cavity. Ideally, the corpse sat like this for 40 days. After that period, the embalmers took the body, washed it, and removed the salt packets. The resulting body was dried out but otherwise recognizable. To improve its appearance, the embalmers would occasionally fill the inside with rags or straw to puff out sunken areas. They even added false eyes, sometimes using onions. The embalmers then entered the last stage of the work, spending about 30 days dressing the body. They applied sticky resin to the body and wrapped it with hundreds of yards of linen bandages. They occasionally stopped either to insert a protective amulet or to recite a chant. Then, after a little more than two months of work, the mummy was complete. All that was left was the opening of the mouse ceremony, in which the mummy was placed into a standing position and symbolically reanimated for the afterlife. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Embalmers originally treated only Egyptian royalty, but when the Old Kingdom gave way to the Middle Kingdom around 1938 BC, the practice started to be extended to the population at large. Embalming reached its peak as an art and science during the New Kingdom, which is dated from 1552 to 1069 BC, though it continued for centuries after. Throughout this period, embalmers would modify their recipes and ingredients, but in general, the mummification process remained the same. The embalming business grew into one of Egypt's most thriving industries. As Salima Ikram, an Egyptologist at the American University in Cairo, noted in a 2006 interview with Nova, some people estimate that there were 70 million mummies, but I think that's an underestimate. Mummification was carried out in Egypt for over 3,000 years. I'm sure more human mummies were made during this time period. Mummification may have moved to the masses, but not all mummies were created equal. In 2018, field archaeologists at the Saqqara Burial Ground found what was purported to be history's first funeral home deep underground in long ignored shafts. After two years of excavation, they discovered a workshop dated to approximately 600 BC. It sported a raised table, drainage channels for blood, and sensible ventilation shafts. If there was any concern about the smell, the very large incense burner could furnish enough aroma to overpower any whip to putrefaction. Furthermore, the archaeologists found considerable amounts of pottery shards as well as oils that were used in the embalming process. 
When reconstructed, Egyptologists saw that they were labeled with ingredients and instructions that provided clues as to what ingredients the embalmers were using to prepare the mummies. All of this adds to our knowledge of ancient Egyptian society. While there is a significant amount of written and even artistic evidence of embalming, there had been little archaeological evidence prior to this discovery. While Egyptian royalty and the richest in society could afford the full embalming treatments, those of lesser means needed to find a more middling vehicle to pass into the afterlife. This was no problem for the embalmers who offered a menu of options that a dead person's relatives could choose from. The process started with the deceased next of kin being presented with model mummies, each of different quality. The bereaved needed to select a tasteful yet affordable plan. According to Herodotus, there were three basic plans. There was the full royal treatment, then there was the middle-class option, which consisted of injecting cedar oil into the body cavity with natron. This dissolved the organs, which were then purged. A low-income person could resort to a simple purge followed by the natron treatment before the body was returned to the next of kin. Herodotus' account holds up to archaeological findings, as some mummies were buried in private, while others were buried in shared chambers. According to National Geographic, the embalmers also provided ongoing services in a priestly capacity, such as caring for the soul of the deceased. Literally hundreds of bodies could be housed within their tombs. The family of the mummified were then responsible for bringing cash donations to keep their lost kin in good graces. Embalmers also had a flourishing business mummifying animals. Since the afterlife was considered to be just like the living world, Egyptians expected to have all the necessary materials for a rewarding post-life. This included animals, which could be used as food, sacrifice to the gods, or as pets. Cats, ibises, crocodiles, dogs, hawks, and snakes were all among the animals that were mummified. Why did it have to be snakes? One section of the Saqqara burial ground contains an estimated 8 million mummified dogs and 4 million ibises in a neighboring area. These were not pets, but instead votive offerings to the gods Anubis and Thoth. It isn't clear if the embalmers themselves were engaged in the procurement of these animals or if they were just doing the embalming. Nevertheless, there was money to be made in this practice. As noted by nature, the animal mummification industry required high production volumes necessitating significant infrastructure, resources, and staffing of farms that reared animals for mummification and subsequent sale. Dedicated keepers were employed to breed the animals, while other animals were imported or gathered from the wild. Temple priests killed and embalmed the animals so they were made suitable as offerings to the gods. While Ka may last forever, the embalming business in Egypt did not. It's unclear when exactly the practice of embalming ended, but it's believed to be connected to the rise of Christianity. As Egyptians converted to Christianity between the 4th and 7th centuries AD, the demand for mummification dwindled, although it's worth noting that early Christians in Egypt did accept mummification to some degree until it faded away. And so the embalming craft of ancient Egypt became lost to history and is now being pieced together by archaeologists. In the embalmer's 3,000-year history, it's estimated that they created at least 70 million mummies, as well as millions of mummified animals. Sadly, most of the legacy of ancient Egypt's embalmers has been lost to posterity due to cannibalism and Victorian-era Gothic parties. Over the centuries, mummies were taken from their tombs for use as medicine. These remains were used as a snake oil treatment for a variety of ailments. One 18th-century medical treatise lists mummy remains for use as a blood thinner, a cough suppressant, a painkiller, and even a menstrual aid. There were also rumors that mummies were used for fuel for steam locomotives and fertilizer, though neither of these claims seems to have a basis in fact. But it is true that mummy remains were used as a paint pigment, and that British Victorians held mummy unwrapping parties. The trend actually started in 1698 with the French consul in Cairo, and by the 19th century, British Victorians were wild for unwrapping mummies. These public dissections actually humanized the ancient Egyptians for many people and provided knowledge about what they were like as individuals. Ultimately, though, it was the embalmers who knew their clients intimately as they transported them to the field of reeds.